thank you so much for joining us um, today for our discussion on the CPT e and changes for 2021. So the idea for today is we're really going to focus on evaluation and management codes, the guidelines that are changing, how services are reported, and those separately identifiable um, services that we sometimes uh, do for our patients. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, these changes, they really begin with reducing the documentation requirements for the history and exam components and really placing the emphasis on the level of medical decision making and the time that's spent with the patient. The change would also eliminate the existing requirement that counseling um, or those uh, coordination of care that must dominate the time spent occupy greater than 50% in order to code for a selected um, time. These uh, changes do drastically alter how we will be re reimbursed on E&M codes, and we're going to get into that a little bit later, but there is a um, significant um, change to those reimbursements on um, codes specifically uh, 99211, 99201, 99212, 213, 214, um, and really the top paying code would be uh, your 99215 or 99205. So when we talk about time, the time really is, this is going to be the focus on our outpatient um, providers. So our primary care providers, our internal medicine providers, our pediatrics. It's not going to affect um, emergency departments. Um, you know, obviously different services use time um, differently. And for time-based codes, it really does help determine the level of E&M services. So what does time include? So physician or other qualified healthcare professionals, and that means those um, advanced nurse practitioners, nurse practitioners, registered nurse, um, LPNs, the American Medical Association has said that qualified healthcare profes professionals have to be a licensed um, professional, so as long as they're a certified medical assistant, um, that would fall into it. So what do those activities include? So that is, um, you know, the time it takes to prepare to see the patient, looking at tests, any labs, um, any sort of radiology, um, you know, reviewing or obtaining any sort of history from previous visits, um, your exam and evaluation when we're there, if you're having any sort of discussions with any um, family members, caregivers, your ordering of medication, test procedures, um, how are you com communicating with other healthcare professionals um, when you're not separately reporting those services? So if you have a care manager or you're doing some sort of CCM um, uh, type visits, then you, this isn't going to be separately reported. Um, maybe getting them involved if you have a dietitian, maybe some sort of behavioral health um, practitioner in the office, that would count as well. And then documenting that clinical information in the EHR um, and then independently interpreting results, again, not separately reportable and then communicating those results to either the patient, the caregiver, or somebody in the family, and any sort of care coordination, again, that's not going to be separately reported. So when we talk about office or other outpatient um, services, we talk about what, what's really determined in that scope by the healthcare professional, what's able to be reported, and then that the care team can collect some of that information um, for the patient, what's medically appropriate. And then we look at the number of complexity or problems addressed at the encounter. Are they new versus established conditions? And how are those um, going to be addressed? So things like um, social determinants of health, a new problem, an uncertain prognosis, um, acute or chronic illnesses, um, is it a minimal problem? So those types of um, different things. So we're going to get into typically how do we um, select that particular level. I think one of the other things to keep in mind is that really CMS has been the only um, payer that has said that they're going to come out and 
use the decision to alter the E&M rules. There hasn't been any other payer, um, you know, that's come forward that says that they're going to do this. So I think one of the things to keep in mind is that when we talk about this and how it's going to change, you know, kind of not really focusing on those history element, elements, um, is that, you know, how are we going to be able to do that? How are we going to be able to identify those patients? Because some of the some of the problems may come with, you know, providers don't really know exactly what the patient's insurance is. Um, you know, are we going to have different rules for different payers? So while some of this um, seems a little bit easier, it can become cumbersome and burdensome um, for the provider, seeing as though, again, CMS really is the only uh, payer that has come out um, with that. And again, it's only your outpatient codes, your 99211 through 215s, 99201 um, through 205. So, and taking a look at the grid, if we look at um, our new patient established level two, um, and a we're looking at just a self-limited problem, um, you know, medical decision making, that's, that's minimal testing, uh, no diagnostic testing or maybe limited diagnostic testing. If we look at um, O3 and 13, again, that's a low risk of morbidity from addition to diagnostic testing or treatment. Um, are we documenting any of those tests? Do we re review any of those notes? Again, that's included in our time and so on and so forth. So as we go down through, you know, 99204s and 214s, the moderate risk of, you know, medical decision making and all of that comes into play. So looking at some of the codes, here's the time that wraps up into this based upon the, um, the CPT code. So again, we want to get halfway to that time, 15 to 29 minutes um, for our, our 99202, and then 30 to 44 minutes for our 99203, up to 59 minutes for our 99204, 45 to 59 minutes, 99205 is our 60 to 74 minutes. So if we think about today and we think about those level twos and level threes, especially for um, you know, our established patients, those don't really require a lot of documentation. I don't know really a lot of providers that if they're coming in for a self-limited problem, they're not really spending a lot of time on documentation, um, especially if they were just in, you know, not so long ago. It's a follow-up visit. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind as well. Then we look at our prolonged services. So there is um, prolonged services with direct patient contact, except with office or other outpatient services. So there are some new codes for prolonged services um, with the direct patient beyond. So again, this is if you're outside of that time for those E&M codes and you're going to bill for additional services, these are the codes that you would use. Um, and we specify how to use those in conjunction with other codes. Um, one thing to keep in mind is we will get these slides sent out to um, everyone after the um, presentation. And then we have some codes that are without direct patient contact, so our prolonged services before and after direct care for spending additional time, um, our 99358 and then 99359 would be that add-on code to be used in conjunction with the 99358. So this will break down our total duration of prolonged services and essentially give you kind of a grade on how you would um, report those. When it says times one times two, that's the units um, that you would use. So uh, based upon the prolonged services, if we're spending um, less than 30 minutes, it's not reported separately. If we're going to hit that 30 to 74, um, we're going to use our 99356 uh, with one unit. And then the total duration of prolonged services without direct face-to-face -face contact, again, less than 30 minutes is not reported separately. And then if we have 30 to 74 minutes, um, we would use that 99358, um, and the grid will take you down through the rest of the uh, codes to use. So what if we have those prolonged clinical staff services with physicians or other qualified healthcare professionals with some sort of supervision? 
um, that's in the outpatient setting. So there is a code 99415 for that for the first hour. And then if you have any additional um, time, 30 minutes with that, you would use that 99416 in conjunction with the 99415. So you would build both codes. If it's with or without direct patient contact on the date of an office or outpatient visit, that program's clinical staff service in office or outpatient setting for the first hour, you would use those 99 codes in conjunction with the 99205 or 99215. And then some more information on prolonged services with the um, 99415 and 99416 codes breaks it down by your um, minute. So here's our total time duration. If we're doing other um, outpatient visits, 99205, how would we build that? Our units and how we would build that for based again upon time. If they're established patient um, versus new patient, uh, the information is here in the grid for you. Okay, when we talk about transitioning to 2021, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, with the time savings, uh, I don't know how much anticipation the providers are really looking forward to that, again, because of the relatively little time that they do spend on those level two and level three visits for our established patients. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind is that medical nece necessity, not medical decision making. So the payments um, and the changes that appear uh, really to provide those distinctions between levels two and three and four to be kind of moot because they are going to be paid um, at the same rate. It's going to be a flat amount under the 2021 um, rules. Only the level five codes retain their existing higher payment. So um, nothing really changes with the long-term standing language in the Medicare claim processing manual. Uh, the manual states that medical necessity is the single most important driver of the code level and that um, Medicare experts do say that the rule still requires the code level to be chosen most accurately to reflect the, the uh, level of medical um, necessity. So it doesn't mean that they can't pick those levels, it just means that um, medical necessity still is always going to trump and play um, a factor into that. So when we talk about transitioning to 2021, how do we successfully do that? Um, so a couple of key things here, we would want to identify, you know, a project lead, is there somebody in the office that can kind of help make that transition um, based on those guidelines? We want to make sure that we're prepared. Are we giving some um, practice and protocols to our staff, to our providers, to our administrative um, personnel? Um, do we have the appropriate coding support uh, for that? Are we, um, you know, going to have our vendor, is our vendor going to be able to um, support that? A lot of times with some of the vendors, they will be able to use, you know, that calculate code option. Um, so reaching out to your vendor um, is really a, uh, a key to make sure is that change going to be there if you are using some sort of calculate code um, based upon uh, your documentation, and if you don't, you know, how are they, um, how are they suggesting that you do that? Um, I would say that the other thing is, is make sure that you're aware of your medical um, malpractice liability with some of the stuff changing that could be um, a factor into that. That is a recommendation by the AMA. Uh, the other thing is, is your compliance plan. As you transition to this, make sure that your compliance plan is updated and you know your financial impact. So one of the things to um, be assured of is that you, you realize that these codes, they will come from CMS with a reduced rate and your medical liability coverage requirements with your payers. So I did say that we would get into some of the codes and I'll send this out as well. So when we look at a um, 99211, so we're gonna look at our established folks here our 99211, with the changes, again, this is CMS only. This is the only ones that have really come forward. That reimbursement rate will be $24. Uh, 
The 99212, 213, and 214 will be a reimbursement rate of $90. So regardless of the level, it'll be $90. And then the 99215 will be 149. When we look at our uh, new patient codes, our 992201, that's $44 reimbursement. 99202, 203, and 204 reimbursed at a rate of $130. And then our 99205 reimburses at a rate of $212. So a significant, um, you know, decrease from previous years and previous data, especially with the flat rate going into effect for those, um, you know, 99202s, 212s, 203s, 213s. Uh, here's a couple of our resources that we've pulled this documentation from. Again, we'll pull out the payment system and send that out to you guys as well as the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And really that's all that we have for um, today. It was just a quick high-level overview. And uh, thank you guys all for joining.